Uh, and that was Christopher Fennell, by the way. Um, and we are going to get underway here. It's a minute past the hour. We have well over a thousand people registered. We are really glad that you are here. We have an excellent class in store for you. It does qualify for one and a half CPE credits. It's called Microsoft Excel Formulas and Functions. And the way our sessions work is that you do need to make sure you're logged in for at least 75 minutes and respond to the polling questions. Our polling questions are queued up and they are ready to go. And at intermittent times throughout the presentation, we're going to launch those. Those are a requirement in terms of receiving CPE. And certainly know that uh, many of you on the line are not taking the class for CPE, but we're still going to ask that you uh, fill those polls out so we can keep track of overall uh, audience participation. And um, I also want to let you know that we are recording today's presentation. Uh, this is not the first time that we've offered this class, and the uh, request for the, uh, for the video uh, was exceedingly high last time and is an extremely valuable resource. And uh, given the nature of this class, uh, it is highly likely that you'll want to go back and revisit some of the slides and or the, uh, the uh, presentation and uh, perhaps follow along at that time with your uh, Excel file. Uh, lucky me, I just got my presentation back up and running just in the nick of time. I had myself a little worried there. I am going to uh, post the first polling question, which is, have you downloaded today's PowerPoint slides and Excel file? These are provided to you in advance. Uh, you can access those by logging into your account. You can go back to the email that were sent as part of the registration process. And there may be some mixed feelings, and perhaps, Dennis, you can, when you get started here, uh, give us some feedback on what you think is more effective to either try to follow along if someone's using a dual screen um, or to uh, simply uh, watch the presentation and go back and revisit the Excel file uh, after the presentation. But we have about 80% of you who have voted. Um, let me make that about 90% of you. And uh, once we get a little bit further, we're going to go ahead and close this down. And about 60% of you haven't yet downloaded the Excel file. So uh, that's fine. We'll make sure that we uh, provide that resource to you in the form of a link. And as a matter of fact, if you look in your chat bar right now, you'll find a shortcut to it. So uh, we're at 90%. It's been almost a minute. Wanted to make sure everyone was comfortable with how that worked. We're now back to uh, Dennis's screen. Actually, there we go. That's what I was looking for. And uh, with that said, uh, it is uh, truly my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Dennis Taylor. All right. Thank you, Scott. And hello, everyone. Uh, for some people, with, uh, if you said we're going to talk about Excel, therefore we're, we're going to talk about formulas and functions, uh, some people might say, well, well, of course, isn't that what Excel is all about? Now, that's not necessarily true for everybody, but let's face it, for many, many people using Excel, the centerpiece of what they do is work with formulas and functions. And whether it's a, a large list like this, maybe not so heavily laden with formulas, or whether it's a worksheet, sort of like this one here maybe, or something like some of the things we see here. There are many, many times when we need to work with formulas. And not all formulas are about financial data, that's to be sure. Excel is very rich in its use of functions. In today's session, we will be talking, first of all, about formulas in general, giving you some, some power tips. We assume, I'm assuming, that most of you have worked with formulas, at least a little bit. Uh, it can be a little bit intimidating if you worry about uh, how many different capabilities Excel has when it comes to working with formulas and functions. Many of you know that the functions, like sum and average and median and many, many others, there are well over, uh, well, quite a few hundred of them, but we don't need to count them exactly, but they're really important as we work with Excel. And you might be an engineer, you might be a scientist, you might be a financial expert, uh, or maybe you're just a record-keeping kind of person who works with a lot of different Excel files. There's so many different times that you can use the built-in functions of Excel. We'll give you some power tips. We'll spend a good deal of time on two major functions, the if function and, and some related functions that are often used with it, and and or. We'll also spend a good deal of time on uh, the VLOOKUP function. Uh, we'll mention also its companion HLOOKUP and show you that sometimes those two functions, powerful as they are, don't give us everything. And so functions like match and index uh, should be on your radar as well. Anytime you're trying to look up data or compare data from different worksheets, or sometimes within the same worksheet, lookup functions, like particularly like VLOOKUP, are going to be really handy. And if we have time, we'll certainly get to many other functions too, like some of the rounding functions. They've got an important role to play. And sometimes people mistakenly use formatting when they really should be rounding. Uh, we'll talk about some text functions and also point out how some of the text functions you won't need to use 
as much anymore because of a new feature called Flash Fill in Excel 2013. There have been a few new functions uh, added in Excel 2010 and Excel uh, 2013. At least one of those, uh, aggregate, added in 2010 is important. We'll definitely talk about that one too. We'll also bring out some date and time uh, formulas and functions and some techniques. So I'm going to start with a few tips here. Uh, first of all, in a different worksheet here, in a worksheet that I think most of us would say, wow, that's kind of a bad looking worksheet. It's kind of disorganized. It's, we're not sure what's going on here. But it is related to, to a particular kind of operation here, and you wouldn't necessarily know what's going on. But uh, let's face it, sometimes you get data from other sources, or maybe this is something you worked on five years ago. You kind of forgot about it. You bring it up. And uh, what kind of questions want, run through your mind? Uh, it certainly would be handy if we could see all of the formulas in this worksheet. And you can do that very quickly with control tilde. And some of you are saying, what's tilde? Well, now I can press it again, control tilde. We go back to normal here. I'm going to zoom in on this cell right here. Uh, I'm simply depicting in cell C1 here uh, one of the keys that on most keyboards tends to be in the upper left corner, at least most US keyboards. Occasionally on a laptop you'll find this off to the right, maybe upper right. But uh, the top symbol is uh, generally called tilde or tilde. The other symbol, most of us don't know what to call it, call it accent. Some books call it accent grave. If we only had a better name for that key, this shortcut would be better known. What does control tilde do? Remember, don't use the shift key in this. Control tilde doubles the width of columns, but more important, whoops, <laughs> more important, uh, it exposes formulas. For example, there's one in E5, there's one right here, just below it, and so on. Every time there's a formula, we see the formula. The column width, uh, widths are doubled to give you a better opportunity to see the entire formula. That's not perfect in all cases, but generally it's helpful. So it's looking like this. Now I'll zoom back to a normal zoom. And by the way, from time to time, I will be zooming in and out, holding down the control key and using the mouse wheel. So that's the best way to zoom because it makes no difference where the mouse is. It can be anywhere. I'm just holding down control as I move the mouse wheel. So here we are again, looking at this worksheet. We're trying to get a bead on it, so to speak, trying to get a quick read of it. It's going to be helpful if we can see these formulas. Control tilde is what we call a toggle, back, back to normal, or now we're seeing formulas, back to normal, and so on. Anytime you want, obviously it makes no content changes. It's just a different way to view the data. And it is represented in the ribbon menu system on the formulas tab. If you've never seen this choice, show formulas, uh, the pop-up tip below it uh, does give you the keystroke shortcut, but they mention the other symbol on the key and it's so tiny, you could easily overlook it. I've even seen this in books where that sort of looks like a speck of dirt or <laughs> a piece of ink or something that got uh, misprinted somehow. So it's control tilde. It would be better known if they used a different symbol. But anyway, it's great, and it's really handy at times. And uh, either, either this button here or, um, on, the, on the formulas tab in the ribbon or control tilde. Another feature that would be helpful, too, if you're in that worksheet troubleshooting mode, You've got to make some sense out of this and also expand it and give it more functionality. One of the things that would be helpful is to always know which cells have formulas in them. Now, you can do this in not quite a dynamic way, but at least you can do it for the moment and over time adjust it too. With the active cell on one cell in the worksheet, just one, and that's important, and I'll come back and restate that. With the active cell in just one location, go to the Home tab in the ribbon, the extreme right button, find and select, and then choose formulas. All the formula cells are highlighted. What I often do, and I would recommend here too, on the home tab in the ribbon in the font group, you've got the fill color bucket. Let's just pop a color onto that, any color you want. Light colors tend to work better. So I'll make them blue, and then click outside of it. So I know at a glance where the formula cells are. Now, it's not dynamic so that if I uh, erase this cell, it's going to stay blue. If I write a new formula there, it's not going to turn blue. So every so often, you would want to remove all colors and, and run this feature again. But again, it's really fast. Home tab, find and select formulas. Now, if you did have three or four cells selected, as we sometimes do, and certainly nothing wrong with that, but it, this is one of those features where Excel will only look within that range. So if I've got these cells highlighted, and I'm on the Home tab, and I go to Find and Select and Choose Formulas, it says, in effect, no cells were found because it only looked within that range. 
So in a counterintuitive way, when you click one cell and apply this feature, it looks throughout the entire worksheet. So a little bit strange there, maybe. Uh, of course, you could click in the upper left-hand corner. That effectively does the same thing. But it's a great tool, and I use it a lot. And, and if you wanted to extend this a little bit, and it's a little bit more work, but if you say, I wanted to highlight all the cells that just have numbers in them, you can go to the same Find and Select button on the right-hand side, but this time choose Go to Special. And then here, you might want to click the box, or click the button, the radio button for Constants, and then uncheck the box for Text and Logicals and Errors. And then click OK, and only the cells with just pure numbers, not formulas, are highlighted. For the moment they're gray, maybe I'll come up here and make them green or yellow or something. So there's a light green. So all of the, all of the light green cells have just raw numbers in them, pure numbers. Uh, the blue cells have formulas. Again, you obviously don't have to do that, but it makes it handy, and it helps you uh, come to understand a worksheet a bit better here, or a bit faster, let's say. Now, when you're doing data entry, and I'll just use the same worksheet maybe off to the right, uh, suppose I'm creating a list over here, and the heading is city, and I'm looking on a sheet of paper here, I'm recording some transactions from different cities, and the city names are repeating. So let me zoom in a little bit here, off to the right there. there we, oops, there we go, other direction. So uh, it just so happens that uh, in these two cells right here, and then in this one, and then in a few down here, uh, and the city is going to be Denver. Now, a lot of you know, you can select non-contiguous cells by using the control key. So I'll drag across these two cells, let go of the left mouse button, and now with the control key held down, click or drag here, and then down here, click and drag maybe, down here, another one, maybe another one. They could even be in different columns. Now, I'm going to type Denver, but as I type this, it looks as if it's only going into cell R13. And that's what will happen if I press Enter. But if I press Control Enter, the data goes in all those cells at the same time. And the same thing is true of numbers. It just so happens that these two numbers here need to be a 25. So does this one. And again, imagine me, I'm looking at a sheet of paper here. I just happen to have seen a lot of 25. so. I highlight all these ahead of time, type 25, and press Control Enter. And the same data goes in all those cells at the same time. Now, you can also do this with formulas, and not always so obviously either. And it is time for some shortcuts, and we'll also use the Auto Sum button here too, times. Uh, I want totals right here, and I also want totals over on the right. So I'll use the Control key and highlight all those. And this time, we don't even have to go to, into a menu. We can use the uh, and use the Auto Sum button if we wish. That's on the Home tab or on the Formulas tab. Or we could even simply press Alt Equal. Alt Equal. We got our totals. And in all cases here, we're adding up those. And of course, over here, we're adding up those and so on. So that's handy. Now, another shortcut. I'm going to undo these by pressing Control Z, undoing my last action. They're highlighted again. I'd like to do an average now. This time I'll use the drop arrow associated with auto sum, choose average, and the averages are all done. And just again to point out, that's an average, and so is that one. And sure enough, over here, same idea. Probably I, I might want to, or I could possibly want to display decimals there because not all those are, are, round, are even numbers. But nevertheless, that's fast, that's easy. Now, I want to undo this again. What if we wanted to do a median? The cells are highlighted. This time I'm going to type equal median. That's the middle value in a list. Or if it's an even number, it averages the middle too. The active cell is in R8. So as I'm typing equal median, I'm highlighting just the cells as if I were doing only that cell. In other words, putting in the formula only for here. I'm not typing the right parentheses. Don't need to here. But if I press Enter, I will only have the median for column R. I'm going to press Control Enter. And all those are medians, not only here, but also over here. And sure enough, on the other side as well, too. We've got medians for all these. So they're quick ways for putting in formulas anytime we recognize a parallel kind of situation. In all these examples with this set of data here, we were working on the six cells above it. So when we've got parallel sets of data like that, it's really handy to be able to use the control key here. Also, with AutoSum, by the way, recognize there are some shortcuts. Remember, the keystroke shortcut for AutoSum is Alt Equal, and sometimes you use that, sometimes you use the button. Remember, on the Formulas tab, you also find AutoSum off to the left. Uh, we want a total right here. 
a lot of people will click auto sum, look at it and say, well, that's good, and they'll press enter. Nothing wrong with that. But as you get used to it, and perhaps a lot of you are, just double click auto sum. You can certainly do that. That's a tad faster. Or possibly type alt equal and enter. So just different ways. Sometimes you, you might want to highlight the data ahead of time. That's not necessarily better. You do have to spend a you know a half second highlighting the data. Then you could either click the auto sum button or alt equal. Either way. If we wanted totals only on the right, we could highlight these cells, press alt equal, we're all set. We could also do the same down here, alt equal, got totals there. Uh, and believe it or not, we could have just highlighted the data this way. If we knew ahead of time we wanted totals on both the right and the bottom, we've got these highlighted. Let's press Alt equal or auto sum either way. That's fast. If we wanted averages instead, we've got our data highlighted. We click the drop arrow for auto sum, choose average. We've got averages on the right and on the bottom. So there's some shortcuts with auto sum. And keep in hey, mind, Dennis, too, I just wanted to let you know that the, your, your audio is coming in and out just a little bit. I don't know if there's any adjustments that could be made on your end. I thought at first it was just computer speakers, but just want to let you know. Okay, okay. Uh, perhaps I'll talk a little bit more slowly. That might help a little bit. Okay, a couple of other thoughts here about this, too. Uh, sometimes when you're, uh, when you're adding data, you type equal sum, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a lazy person, and you won't save a huge amount of time, but uh, suppose I want to add up some data here from different lists here. Uh, I might type equal sum, but on the other hand, I might just click auto sum or just start with alt equal. And, and then I don't want to really add that data, but I want to I grab the Florida data, so I'll highlight it instead, comma. And now I want to pick up the Europe data off to the left. I'll drag across that, comma. And although this would certainly be weird in real life, I'll pick up some of the data up here over in column B, comma, and then I want to add the number 1,000. I mean, I'm just throwing in the idea here that you can certainly use the sum function in a, in a variety of different ways, gathering data from different locations without doing a lot of typing, using a combination of the mouse and, and, a, and, a, and the comma button here. So I'm just simply adding data from a bunch of sources. And I didn't type equals sum. I pressed alt equal to begin the process. So auto sum or its shortcut uh, uh, alt equal are certainly handy at times. Now, if we're working with data here, let's say in this worksheet here, maybe we're about to calculate a new, new compensation amount. I'm going to zoom in on this, too, to make this a little clearer. In column L is a compensation value, and everybody's going to get the new, new rates here. But instead of 2.91, well, actually, we're going to keep the 2.91%. What I want to do, below, by the way, and I'll often do this with my examples. I usually do this ahead of time, but um, I, would, I, I don't like examples that show addresses in column O. It's, just, it's harder to read and sometimes mistake them for zero. So I'm simply going to put that right there in, in P1. All right, there are a few different ways to write a formula here. Certainly one of them is going to be equal L2 times this amount here in P1, and then that would calculate the amount of the increase, and we could simply add on to that the existing salary. Others of you might want to use a, a parenthesis there uh, and put in P1 plus 1, that, that being within parentheses. So there's certainly different ways to write this. But the one thing that's going to be consistent about this is you will be getting data out of P1 and L2. And a lot of you know, if we start to copy this down the column in its current state, the L2s will become L3, L4, L5, and that's good. That's what we want. But P, P1 will also change into P2, P3, et cetera, and we don't want that to happen. We want P1 to be absolute. So either just after typing it or maybe right now, perhaps, we want to make sure that this has the indicators that it's an absolute value. Now, you can type a dollar sign in front of the P, in front of the 1, or as long as the cursor is around the data, anywhere there or even highlighted, you can simply press the function key F4 to make this an absolute address. Now, I want to stress here, if you've never seen this before, don't think of this as something that's intuitive. It's not at all. I mean, dollar sign in the example here just happens to be the kind of format we might want also, because we're dealing with salaries and compensation amounts. But dollar sign is simply the symbol that means if this address well, it's better, better spoken, better said. 
if this formula is going to be copied, we want this address to not change. That's an absolute address. Now, small tip here. If I press enter, the active cell will move down into the next cell. I want it to stay here because I'm ready to copy this. So I'll press control enter. There we are, like this. Now, uh, by the way, something occurred to me. I should have said this earlier, and it's not a major thing, but I am using Excel 2013. You might be using Excel 2010 or Excel 2007. Uh, nearly everything we've done so far works exactly the same. In a minute or so, there's one slight difference. But I will try and keep up with that and, and point out from time to time there might be some slight differences in these versions. But as a general rule, with formulas and functions, uh, usually what the difference is, a few new functions are added with each version. So once again, here's this formula. I'll double click to remind you what it looks like. And again, you could certainly do this in a couple of different ways. But that looks good, and we're going to copy this down the column. Uh, but instead of using copy and edit paste techniques, a lot of you know there's a better way to do this. We could certainly drag from the lower right-hand corner, uh, but if you pardon the pun, this could be a real drag. Because in this example here, although I haven't shown you how many records there are, it goes down to about row 700. And easily you could imagine how that might be, you know, 7,000 or 70,000. We've got a lot of room here. Great shortcut, one of Excel's best. We're going to double click the lower right hand corner. And this gets copied down the column. Now I think the first question in your mind would be, how far did it get copied? And not so well known is the shortcut, control period. And there we see it. You might want to scroll a little bit beyond that just to make sure, but we see it, control period. Control period again takes us right back up top. So that's a good follow-up whenever you're copying formulas or data down a column. You can do this with data too, by the way, uh, numbers or, or text. So that's a great shortcut. Let me backtrack again and, and remind you that the keystroke shortcut here, if explained out of context, seems practically ridiculous. What does control period do? Whenever you have some cells highlighted, control period moves the active cell around the corners. Well, how exciting is that? How often would you ever use that? Now, if you did use it, you might have some data highlighted. It make a little more sense, but out of context, it seems practically worthless. But once again here, when we copy this down the column by double-clicking, I think we would want to know how far did it get copied? Control period. There we are, down to row 699. Now, I do want to point out a change that occurred in Excel 2010. And let me undo with Control Z. If you were using Excel 2007, and, and you, one of these compensation amounts was missing. So I'm going to momentarily just take this one out of here. Imagine it's not there. If this were 2007 and you double-clicked, the formulas would only get copied to here. Starting in 2010, and certainly in Excel 2013, we don't worry about that. So I'll double-click here. It's going to zip right past that. In effect, Excel looks not only to the adjacent column to the left, but it looks, you might say, leftward to see if this is all part of a larger list, and it is. So it goes all the way to the bottom of the column. And I'll press Control period to verify that. And we see it goes down to row 699 just as it did before. So that's, that's worth noting, and that's a good change too. So once again, pressing Control Z a few times, we can undo recent actions. There we are, back to here, and I'll double click again. Now there could be times too when you're tabulating data that you just want to know the totals, and you don't even necessarily need to see it on the screen or in, in, in a worksheet cell. Uh, this company, what, what were they spending on their various compensations? What are they spending now, let's say? I'm going to click column M. Uh, it's $44.5 million. And of course, I say of course, but <laughs> not always, in the status bar at the bottom of the screen, we see various statistical measures. Now, you're not necessarily going to see all of these. You have control over what's being displayed. And what triggers this display is highlighting two or more cells with numbers. So I've highlighted two cells. Gives me the total, minimum, maximum, average, and so on and so on. But I can see at a glance by clicking column M what this company is spending on various compensations here. Forty-four and a half million. I can see an average amount there, which is a little misleading because some of those people are uh, half-time in contract and so on. I can also compare it with the previous salary. And moving off here to the left, we can do things like, for example, here, I'm going to click column F and see that the most recent person was hired on June 6th. 
of this year. We got a max down there. The person who's been here the longest was hired back in June of 93, so on. Average years of service, we'll see this down here. So how do you control this? There's a possibility that you're not seeing anything under these circumstances. Right-click the status bar. You'll see lots of check marks, but in this cluster right here, there are six different statistical measures. I usually leave them all checked. Why not? Doesn't hurt. Sometimes that information, a lot of it isn't useful, but I, I often want to see some and average and sometimes max and min and so on. So I usually leave them all checked. But you have the right to come in here at any time and change these. And whatever change you make is going to stay that way until you change it again. If we were looking at job ratings, why would I ever want the total? It wouldn't make any sense at all, but I do want an average. So average job rating here is almost 3.2. So it tells me something about the data at a glance. Now, suppose we really do want a total here. And I want to total the new comp here. I just put the headings over here ahead of time. So I want to add up that data. Why not use AutoSum, Alt Equal, for starters? There we go. And when you press Alt Equal, Excel makes a guess, sometimes a bad guess. Why would I want to add up uh, those two cells there? That wouldn't make any sense at all, the new and the old. Uh, what I really want to do is add up all the data in column M. Now, what some people will do here, and it's certainly not wrong, is to click on cell M2 and maybe press uh, shift control down arrow, something like that. Or maybe start clicking and dragging from M2 downward, or maybe even typing. But it's going to be much, much faster if we simply click column M. And that's it. Enter. We got our total. Now, this is good for a number of reasons. First of all, it's got a clean look to it. Uh, at first, maybe it you know, you're not sure what it means, but this means column M. That means everything in column M. M1's got text in it, so what? It's ignored. Now, what happens if this list grows or shrinks? We don't have to readjust this formula. So it's ideal for dynamic situations. And it's easier to read, too. If this said M2 colon M699, if we added five new records, we'd have to change this for it to be accurate. Now, of course, you've got to know your data and know that there are no interim subtotals within this list anywhere. You don't have a grand total on the bottom and so on. But it's really handy. And using the entire column references and formulas sometimes is really going to be helpful. Now, a quick average here, I might do this by going to the drop arrow for auto sum. I'll choose average, ignore what it's doing, click column M and enter. Average comp. Looks like that. So on. Median isn't in that list, so we have to type it. And here, too, I'll point out, when you're typing function names, and I did this earlier, too, there's no reason to capitalize those. It doesn't hurt, but because they're capitalized later, some people make the assumption that they needed to be capitalized. Uh, equal median. I'm going to click column M. I don't need to put in the right parentheses. Uh, a lot of times people, oops, hold on there a second. Something happened on the display. And it looks as if my screen has frozen. This happens from time to time. What I might need to do here is uh, possibly another restart. What I'm doing is attempting to log in again. I think that's uh, there's nothing else seems to be happening. Uh, okay. Should take less than a minute here. Let me know when you want me to convert it back over. I, I didn't know if there was anything okay. private there, so uh, I'll make you presenter when you're ready. Yeah, actually someone proposed a very good question. I appreciate that. Uh, polling question while we wait. So 
Absolutely. Let's head into our polling lounge and uh, go and answer a polling question here. This is poll number two, by the way. And this is a requirement for CPE, and this class is, of course, eligible for one and a half credits. And even if that is not your motivation for being here, we want to make sure that we get our responses in and close this down. But uh, I'll go over the results here in just a second. And we could even go into our second one. So we can knock a couple out of the way, Dennis, if you need more time. So it's not a problem. Okay. Okay. All right, we're at 91%. And I believe the response is VLOOKUP. Is that right, Dennis? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, by far, apparently, <laughs> from what I've heard. When I was doing a lot of public seminars, I would always ask people of why they came to the seminar or, or what features in Excel they came to learn about. And, and many, many times, VLOOKUP was there. Often, with the pivot tables is, is usually the, the top two. Sure. Yeah, we're going to ask a question at the end, too, that that, uh, uh, that dri dives in a little deeper there to find out what would be of uh, great interest for you for future sessions. So we'll keep that in mind as we consider pivot tables. And uh, this is the next polling question. We're at number three of six. And there is no requirement by NASA in terms of how frequently the polls are released. So there's no problem in doing a couple back-to-back -back here. And over half of you are saying Excel 2010. No surprise there. And we're doing better on this poll. We're at about 95%. And we'll close this one down here in a second. Uh, I keep getting the message that I'm already logged in here, so I'm trying to uh, essentially log out. So. Do you want me to make you presenter again? Uh, not yet. OK. I'm a little reluctant. Uh, yeah, it looks like Dennis, you got booted out. So we're going to have to wait till he logs back in. Sorry about this, folks. Okay. There Please we go. Me. Dennis, you're back okay. in now. And make you an organizer. And we'll make you a presenter. And when you're ready, you can accept that. We still have a full hour left to go, and uh, we can always extend a little past if we need to for Q&A. Sorry for the disruption, but these things happen when we're using a lot of technology. And they happen when Murphy's Law is present. Someone had asked if there are any handout materials, and the answer was yes. All right. I was filibustering there. Dennis, are we back in? Uh... Uh, I'm, trying, uh, I'm trying to activate my. Uh... Excel here might have to shut down the current version of Excel. Sorry, folks, I've run out of stories to tell. I could tell you about my weekend, if you'd like. Maybe anyone, someone has some good Excel nightmare stories themselves they'd like to share. OK, I, I'm restarting Excel. We should be up momentarily here. And we're, what we were talking about was uh, the fact that you, um, and let's see, we can probably do it this way. There we go. Yeah, I was about. I was talking here about median and this idea. Uh, whenever you're typing a function, first of all, it doesn't have to be capitalized. Uh, and this example here too, rather than highlighting the data, as we did in the previous two examples, I'll simply click column M so we can get the median there. Don't have to type or write parentheses. Anytime you're using a function by itself and you're not doing any kind of nesting and not doing anything else unusual in the formula, 
But when you have only a single set of parentheses, you don't have to type the right parent, just press enter. It's a minor time saver, but it, you know, it helps speed things up a little bit too. Okay, let's start talking about the if function, uh, an important function, almost programming-like. Uh, and for many people, it can be uh, easy to use. In fact, many examples are easy, they're straightforward. Uh, it can also, it has the ability, you might say, to, to deal with very complex situations. And you might occasionally encounter an if function that just seems to go on and on and on. So we've got a worksheet here. And we, this company has decided to give bonuses to people based on their job rating. So we see the job ratings there. And for the moment, uh, that's all we really need to see here. I am going to make column K wider, not because we really need to ultimately, but I want to make sure as I use this function that it's large and clear on the screen here. Let's imagine in English, this is what the company has said. If your job rating is four or five, we're going to give you a $2,000 bonus. Otherwise, nothing. So the if function allows us to test for a condition and then provide two answers, one for when the condition is true, another for when the condition is false. And in its simplest form, that's all the if function does. And many, many times it's straightforward. And when you're working with your own data, it's real clear. Equal if, left parentheses. A logical test. Sometimes you'll be comparing two different cells or maybe a cell with some kind of a, a breakpoint value. You can compare a cell with a formula. You can compare with a text string. A lot of different possibilities here. A simple one we're going to be use here, using here is J2. And we can do this in two ways. We can indicate that it's greater than 3. So what could it be? It's got to be 4 or 5 if it's greater than 3. We could state it this way. Or we can put in the greater than symbol followed by equal to and put in a 4. That means greater than or equal to 4. So either of those two constructions are going to work for this context. Comma. What's going to be the answer here? The answer could be a cell reference. It can be a value. It can be a text string. It can be a formula. It can be a blank. Double quote, double quote. We'll put in a blank. We want to put in 2,000 in the example. If it's a number, it need not be enclosed in double quotes. If it's text, it's within double quotes. So when this condition is true, the answer is 2,000, comma. When it's not true, if we want to put in zero, that's fine. We can put in zero. If we want to put in space or blank, actually, there is a difference, by the way. Blank is double quote, double quote. That's what we'll put in there. And that will display nothing in the screen. If you want text, now an HR professional probably wouldn't do this, but you could put in something like this, or maybe do better or whatever, but let's say we don't go there. We'll just put in blank. We don't need to type that right paren. I'm going to press Control Enter and then double click the lower right hand corner and we'll have a bunch of answers. Pressing F2 to go into edit mode for just the top cell re-exposes the formula. So nothing too sophisticated, nothing too fancy here. You can see the other answers. Uh, currently we're not seeing the answer for cell K3, but it was a blank. You saw it there briefly. And we see all the other answers that seems to make sense. So nothing too unusual about this. And again, I only made the column wider because we are going to expand this function, and I want to make sure that you can see all the different things we're going to be doing here. So after a while, the company changes its mind and says, uh, okay, we're going, to, we're going to alter this a little bit. Uh, the people who have a job rating of three, uh, they deserve a bonus, although less, less of a bonus. So here's, a, here's what you wouldn't necessarily know. The logic happens in a left to right order. When this condition is true, the answer is 2,000 and the function ends. When the condition is not true, you could say the logic jumps behind this second comma here. And what might we want to do if we're considering giving job ratings to people who have uh, three here? Put in another if. This is called a nested if. Now remember, the logic will only go here when the job rating is one, two, or three. So we're going to start all over again, so to speak, another if if this J2 equals 3. On this case, it does happen to be equal to 3. When that's true, comma, we're going to give these people uh, $800. Comma, when it's not true, nothing. That's an if inside of an if. These are called nested ifs. We need another right paren that must be typed. Now, since all these cells are highlighted, I'll press Control-Enter. It's going to take care of all of them. And I'll press F2 again so we can see that top entry. 
So there we are. We've got three possible answers, 2,000 or 800 or blank. And we see those spilling out in column K over there. And they, we only see the 800 in the case of where the job rating is 3. Now, in the first one, of course, it's, three, it's 800 there also. Oh, now, imagine, now you might question the wisdom of the company. They're even going to give a small job rating to the people who have twos. And um, we'll give them a token, $100, as if to say, you know you can do better. So another if in here. Now, at this point, we, are only, we would only be encountering those who have job ratings of 1 or 2. So we're going to check to see if it's equal to 2, comma. And if it is, we'll give these people $100. If not, blank. This is an if inside of an if inside of an if. Now, nobody's really counting, but that counts as two nested ifs. Let me complete the entry and redisplay it. There we are. Now, you might have seen situations like this, or possibly you will see situations with even more ifs. And in older versions of Excel, before 2007, the most nested ifs you could have had was seven. Now, this is only two, so you could imagine what that might look like. And the logic starts to get pretty involved, maybe, at times. And believe it or not, enough people said to Microsoft, we don't have enough nested ifs. We need more. So Microsoft responded by giving us 64. Imagine what that might look like, 64 nested ifs. Now, uh, it's not a goal to have more nested ifs, but if the logic demands it or if the situation demands it, this might be a solution here. If there were a mathematical association between the job rating number and the number, uh, and a mathematician might be... Uh, better at this than some of us, we could, we could come up with a formula here. We might not even need an if. In the example here, the numbers are a little bit irregular, so we need something like this. But I also want to take this in a different direction. And that's the idea that sometimes you've got what might be called a compound condition. So scrolling to the left here, I'm going to bring into, into view here two other fields, the years of service and the status. I don't need to see the benefits right now, so I'm going to right click column I and hide this. There we are. But I want to change this. The company has changed its mind again. It's going to backtrack a little bit, but then expand it in the following way. We're only going to give bonuses to people who have a good job rating, but they must be full-time. So let's say we, we clean out a lot of this, or get rid of some of this at least, and kind of start over, but put in the word and right after the left parentheses. Left parentheses. By the way, the function called and can be a standalone function. Uh, many times it's embedded within an if, but it can be a standalone function by itself. We want to say two things. You've got a good job rating. It's four or five, comma, and oh, we don't use the word and out here. We use it before the parentheses. And your status here, that's in cell H2, equals double quote full time. You must spell it exactly the way you see it. Actually, the upper lower case isn't critical, but the spacing certainly is. F-U-L-L -L space time. Right parentheses, comma, 2,000, if not blank. We need to get rid of this comma, and we don't need as many trailing parentheses out there now. So in English, what are we about to say? If you've got a good job rating and your status is full time, you'll get the 2,000. Now, that means if and only if. In other words, both of these must be true. Now, I remember when I first saw the and, and I had been a prior user of Lotus 1, 2, 3, and the old Lotus 1, 2, 3 put the word and between the conditions. But the reason Excel doesn't do this, and a good reason, too, is that not only are you limit, or can you have two conditions here, but you can have three, four, or five, up to 31, I believe it is. And repeating the word and between every condition here would be quite cumbersome and lengthy. So think of the word and as appearing between these, but we might have three conditions, four conditions, and when all of them are true, and only when all of them are true, is this the answer right here? So when both of these are true, you get $2,000, otherwise nothing. So I'm going to recalculate these, and there we see what's happening. And here's the redisplay again. So in some cases, for example, in row seven, row eight, Row 7, that person is full-time, but doesn't get the job rating because he or she does not have the right job rating. And farther down there in row 10, good job rating, great job rating, but that person is hourly, doesn't get it. Got to have both. And sure enough, 
a companion function called or, and we'll use it in the same way we use it in English. I think you know what's going to happen here. If either condition is true, either you have a good job rating or you are full-time, and of course that includes both, control enter and redisplay it. That's a more popular decision by management. As we see here, many more people are getting the, uh, the increase here. So that's certainly uh, expanding it a bit. Now, when you know the data, when you work with it, and you've been working with it, these things fall into place maybe a little bit more uh, easily and readily than you might think. The logic is clear. It's strictly standard logic here. I, it's easy to say that, but sometimes when these are thrown into your face, you kind of kind of sit down and figure them out a little bit. Now, sometimes you use ands and ors together. I don't think too many people will do that that often, but just to show that you can do it. And we're not trying to say, in effect, that you know, you want to make these more complex, but uh, uh, this company says, rechanges its mind again and says, okay, the following. We're going to give you a bonus for one of two major reasons. Either you have a good job rating, that's that, but if you don't, you might have the combination of being full-time, comma, and your years of status out here, or your year, I'm sorry, your years, years of service, that's what I meant to say years of service are greater than nine. So here's an and inside of an or. Now, once again, if this is thrown into your face, you've never seen it, it's like, whoa, what's, what's going on here? It seems kind of crazy, but it's not ultimately. To complete that and redisplay it. So we've got situations here where maybe somebody doesn't have a good job rating, like the person in row 11 down there. That person does not have a good job rating, but on the other hand, that person does have the combination of 19 years of service and full-time meets the other two criteria, although it doesn't have a good job rating. So we can see how these play out. And again, when it's your data and you've been working with it, you might be surprised how what seemingly is kind of complex falls into place nicely here as we look at these examples here. Now, if that's all we wanted to do with if here, and we were done with this, of course, the column all along didn't have to be that wide. I'm going to double-click the boundary between K and J out there, double-click, and of course, it need only be this wide. The column need only be as wide as the, as the answers, and that makes sense there. And how much is the company spending on bonuses? I'll click column K. They're spending $918,000. I can see that in the status bar at the bottom. That's it. So that's an expenditure, of course, and they've probably thought that out ahead of time, or at least they're thinking it out now. And by simply changing that top formula uh, to two, from 2,000 to something else, we have a different total. And even more flexible, you could imagine, instead of this 2,000 being here, maybe there's a number out in cell uh, you know, P2 or somewhere out there, and it's uh, no matter what the entry is here, we're going to pick up the value from cell P2. So we could put in P2 here with an absolute address and put a number out there and then have that flexibility to, to jump back and forth even. And some of you may even be familiar with a feature called Goal Seek, where you can say, in effect, I want the total of the new bonuses to be 750000 That's it. You tell me what this rate needs to be. And that's, that's kind of a cool feature, too. All right. Uh, one more example of this, by the way. We're not going to do too much with this, but just to point out a nice little shortcut and a tip here, too. On a different worksheet, this one here that we had seen earlier, whoops, momentarily close that. There we go. On this worksheet that we saw earlier, there is a form at the bottom that's a, it's a bit, uh, bit unwieldy. And I'll zoom in on it and double click. And imagine if that just sort of fell into your lap and you're trying to figure out what's going on there. That's, that's a lot to handle. A lot of ands and ifs. Now, Here's a little shortcut that seemingly, for the moment, is not, uh, not uh, related, but it is. If you were putting in a column heading and you want to put in, uh, for example, 2014 salary, you might, as you start to type it, think, you know, this, this column is going to be a lot wider because the heading is so wide. Let's put salary in the same cell right underneath this. Let's press Alt-Enter, and I'll type salary and enter. All I did was press Alt-Enter, and then the column could be narrower if we're only going to be putting in that amount. So how does that apply to this function here in cell B42? I'm going to double-click. There it is. I'm editing this right now. I'm going to click in front of the second if and press Alt-Enter. 
and then the next if, and then the next one, and all of them ultimately, and down here too, and even the first one maybe. Now, I'm not saying that there's instant comprehension here, but when the formula is displayed like this, I've got a much better chance to figure out what's going on. So, and this doesn't change anything. In other words, if I press enter, no, no result has changed. As it turns out, if, we, if you really did work with this logic, I think you eventually realize it could be more efficient. We're not going to worry about it, but just to point out the idea. And you can do this in, in any formula if you wish. By pressing Alt-Enter, you introduce a line break, and sometimes it clarifies the logic or maybe the lack of logic within a function. Notice the color coding there of the parentheses. This is four nested ifs, four nested ifs. So imagine what seven would look like or 10 or 20. Almost unthinkable. Anyway, shortcut there. Now, I want to go back to the other data. And imagine, what if you had uh, more or less mastered the if function, or you used it a lot, and it's all well and good. By the way, I meant to, <laughs> there's a term I want to jump back to just momentarily here. Uh, we sometimes refer to functions like this as job security formulas. Uh, nobody knows how to fix this except you, and maybe you've made it more cumbersome than necessary. So it's not always the case. All right, back here. If you've gotten pretty proficient with the if function, what if you had to come up with a tax rate here? Now, off to the right, we're about to see a tax table. What I'm going to do is hide columns P, Q, and R. We don't need to see them for now. Right click and hide. We've got a tax table over here. Let me uh, actually delete column S. We don't need that. Yep, there we go. Okay, so we're trying to look up a tax rate here based on a table here. And maybe you've worked with lookup tables, maybe you haven't. But if you are trying to somehow use the if function, and it could be theoretically done, and you're trying to come up with answers for this table, because there are, what, I think there are 11 different answers here, it's probably going to take about uh, a not, at least nine nested ifs to get there. The if function is not the way to go here. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that the answer to complex ifs is going to be a lookup function, but in some cases it will. First of all, uh, there is a function we're about to talk about, an important function. And as you saw in the polling question, this is the most important function for many, many people, and it's the one that's most frequently Googled out on the web, uh, which is the function that people are trying to find out about. There are two major lookup functions, and of course some others too, VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. V means vertical, H means horizontal. When you're looking up information in a table, the table might be oriented vertically, like this one. And that's probably more commonly seen than the other kind of table, like we have off to the right here, which is oriented horizontally. I'm going to zoom back a bit here so we can see both of these together. Just by showing a horizontal and a vertical table together that contain the same information, I think you can probably see why VLOOKUPs are much, much more common. And I'd estimate, at least in my experience, that anytime there's a lookup information where you're trying to uh, compare information from different sets of data, uh, about 80% of the time maybe, VLOOKUP is the one to be used. You can just see how it just fits on the Excel screen better. Now, when you're trying to compare information with, with another set of information, uh, many, many times it, it could be two columns, but by no means are we saying here that this is a two-column situation only. Sometimes you have many, many columns. This can be quite involved. And the example I'm about to show here, again, I want to be careful to su somehow suggest this is, these are not the only kinds of examples. Uh, another situation where people are trying to make comparisons might be something, and again, these, I don't want to make these two uh, suggest that they're necessarily typical, but here's a different set of names. What if this data is in one worksheet or one workbook, and this data is in another, and you're trying to match up names, and you've got thousands of them? You're going to have some big problems looking them up. Now, when I say table of information, many times when you work with VLOOKUP, you see that word table. Uh, that's starting to get a little confusing because Excel has introduced a new feature in 2007 called the table. Uh, and so we want to be a little bit careful with how we use the terms. But let's say matching up information from different sets of data that might be on different worksheets and different workbooks seems to be an increasing need, partially based on the idea that many of us these days are getting 
getting data from other sources, maybe the internet, maybe from another company or another service or another piece of software, and we're trying to reconcile or pull data together, the function you're most likely going to need is going to be VLOOKUP. And these lists sometimes are enormous in depth and sometimes in width as well. So let's start with a, with a somewhat simple example and also point out something else here. When we work with lookup functions, whether VLOOKUP or HLOOKUP, there are two major styles, you might say, two major types. Sometimes when we're looking up data, we need to find information exactly. Suppose we're looking up somebody's name. It's got to be an exact match. Suppose we're looking up social security number. It's got to be exact. The other situation, which we're about to show first, is generally referred to as an approximate match. So here's what we're about to do. We're about to use a VLOOKUP here in column N that, in effect, will be comparing this value, the 53,000, with the left column of VLOOKUP. By definition, VLOOKUP will make a comparison with the left column of a set of data. Call it a table, call it what you want, but, for example, this list right here. Now, momentarily stepping out of Excel, thinking only as you how you read numbers and see them in a list, if someone makes $53,000 here, which tax rate is that person, does that person have? Let's imagine, you know, if only our tax system were this simple. Of course it isn't. Maybe this is an adjusted rate, so we're not going to quibble with the details. But what would be your assessment? Probably 7%. Most of you probably, or let's say many of you probably, have uh, done your own taxes at different times. You know how, as you get toward the bottom line, what are you, you're comparing a number with a list, and if you have not reached a certain value, you pay the value associated with the previous number. So if you haven't reached 55,000 here, then you're going to be 7%. That's how VLOOKUP will work here. So I'm going to make column N a little bit wider. It doesn't ultimately need to be, but like with if, I'll do this, and I'll zoom in even more. This is an example of an approximate match. There are two kinds of major VLOOKUPs an approximate match, and exact match. Equal VLOOKUP, left parentheses. What are we looking at? This value in M2, the 53,000, comma. The pop-up tip next says table array. Where is this data? It's right here. Let's go highlight it. Now, this can be on another worksheet. If it were, I'd click that other worksheet and go highlight the data there. And that's a common situation. We're not in any way suggesting when, when you're doing lookups that these must be on the same sheet. A lot of times they're not. But that's the table location. Table array, as it says in the pop-up here. Comma. The third part of this, column index number. And that doesn't quite explain itself, but which column of the table has the answers that we're looking for? We're looking for those percentages. They're in column T. But we don't put in a T here. We put in the number 2. It's the second column as we look at the table left to right. Column S is column 1. Column T is column 2. Don't need to press parentheses or put in the right parent. I'll simply press Control Enter. That's looking good. That's probably not the way we'd want to see it displayed. So up on the Home tab, there's the percent button. So there's our answer. Unlike the IF function, which almost sort of you can follow it along step by step, VLOOKUP particularly if you don't use it very often, you have to kind of remind yourself what it does. It doesn't, you might say, explain itself. Here's the value we're looking up. Here's this table array somewhere else. Here's the column of that table array that has the answer. There it is. Now, before copying this down the column, we need to make this absolute. Now, I'll give you a better way to do this in a second, but let's say we make it absolute. We highlight the data, press F4. Control Enter, so the active cell doesn't move. Double-click the lower right-hand corner, and we've got a bunch of correct answers here. Once again, pressing F2 so we can see this. Now, uh, because it's absolute, it tends to look a little more dense, a little more crowded, and because we're using column S in the example here, too, uh, the S's and the dollar signs, particularly if you were at a lower zoom level, they kind of they blur together here. Nevertheless, we have correct answers here. Now, a couple of thoughts about approximate matches, and this is confusing at times, but if these numbers are not in ascending order, you will get some bad answers. Now, they're not going to be bad in the sense of looking wrong. You'll just have to sort of discover them later, maybe uh, unhappily. 
Uh, suppose this 35 was just an 85 by mistake here. Now, as you keep an eye on column N, it's quite possible that most of those are not going to change. Maybe none of them on our screen. I think one of them did at the bottom there. 